I'm John Kachoyan, Literary Manager of Australian Plays, and we're here today to talk to Zoe Dawson about her play Australian Realness, which has its world premiere at the Malthouse Theatre in Melbourne in August. Hi Zoe. Hi John. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Uh, so where are you in the process of, of writing this brand new play? Uh, I'm in the final stages of writing the play. I I have to do probably a couple more passes before rehearsals start in mid-July. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm just kind of going through and doing a few last uh, cosmetic changes to it, but uh, I'll be in the room for the first couple of weeks of rehearsals. That's probably where more changes will happen once the play is um, being rehearsed and it's up on the floor. So at the moment my job is kind of almost done or I'm, he I'm heading towards the end of my job while everyone else is just starting to start yeah. their jobs. The actors and the designers and the directors are all starting to um, take off and I'm sort of in the process of handing it over. That's great. Yeah, which is a nice place to be after. A few years of working on it. Yeah, so how did this work come about? Uh, well, the work started uh, a couple of years ago. It, um, it came from a kind of image uh, and I think most of my plays that I've written start with a kind of image and um, they usually come from watching theatre or, or seeing theatre or reading theatre. I find that that's the only place that I really get inspiration for, for writing plays um, and it came from seeing a lot of naturalistic family dramas, uh, which is the sort of form and the mode that this play starts in. And I had seen a few plays in a row that uh, presented a kind of middle-class white Australian family um, in a naturalistic, very realistic set, kitchen sink drama. And I was seeing one and I just sort of had this, this fantasy of, um, uh, of, of, somebody else coming into the space like it was sort of this play that had 12 characters in it and they were all middle class and they were all white and I was like I just want a big dirty bogan to burst <laughs> through the door I like yeah it was um it felt like uh the, this these characters on the stage were talking about all of these kind of middle class concerns and I just thought I don't know if that's really what these people as a sort of um reflection of our society. I don't know if that's what they're really scared of. I think there's other things that these people are more scared of than, you know, selling their beach house or <laughs> worrying about, um, yeah, uh, the kind of domestic concerns. And um, so I just got really interested in that, the dramaturgy of those plays and, and, and where they've come from and their legacy, why we see so many of them, why naturalism is kind of still seen as the, the um, the kind of a real type of theatre and when theatre is such a uh, such a limitless metaphorical amazing space I, I it got me curious of why we why we frame so much of our uh, Australian drama through this lens of of naturalism and why why do you think that's the inheritance of Australian sort of main stage theatre what is it about naturalism that has been useful perhaps or, yeah. or that isn't as useful now yeah it's a good question because um, you know, uh, we, we can go, the automatic response is probably we'll go back and look at um, colonial British drama and our inheritance, but something like Shakespeare is much less naturalistic than, um, than the, the legacy we have now. Um, I'm not sure. It feels like it was very prevalent in the 80s and 90s. Um, and I guess it's, maybe it was about the advent of television uh, and theatre kind of replicating the, the storytelling that we're seeing in those avenues. Mm. I'm not sure if I know enough about the form uh, as a kind of phenomena to, to comment on, but certainly in Australian drama, um, this play, Australian Realness, is set in, or it starts in 1997, which was around about the time that I started to see theatre. Uh, when I was in high school growing up in the country, I would come to Melbourne on the train and I had a, like, you know... Um, mini like young person subscription to the MTC because that's all I knew that you know yeah. um, and so these were the plays I was seeing um, this was my introduction to theatre and I was yeah. like oh that's what theatre is theatre is um, people making cups of tea and um, talking about uh, and yeah and talking about their relationships and so it's kind of been a, um, a, a my own writing journey has been kind of discovering things that exist outside of that mm. and we're publishing alongside Australian Realness, two of your other works, The Unspoken Word is Joe and Conviction. And, you know, they don't form a trilogy necessarily, but there's a connection or some through lines between them. Do you, do you want to talk about what they might be and how they might be different as well? 
Yeah, that's a great um, a great question. There's definitely through lines, I think, informally, mm. in that the plays are all, um, I think, the unspoken word is Joe, Conviction, and um, Australian Realness all kind of frame themselves as attempts, an attempt to do something properly, an attempt to do something in the way that, you know, m I as a playwright and the, the work as a piece of theatre is supposed to. Um, the well-made play. Yeah, the well-made play. It's, yeah. it's trying to do... Um, it's trying to fulfil its legacy as an Australian play. So The Unspoken Word is Joe is framed as a play reading and it it's framed as the play reading of Zoe Dawson's first play. And it was my first play and it did come out of an attempt to sort of sit down and go like, okay, um, what do I what do I write a play about as a like 25 year old white Australian woman? What I guess I write about. What should I write about? What should I write yeah, about? Yeah. 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 But then being very aware of the cliches as they came out of, you know, as they came out and, and sort of, the play is kind of commenting on that <clears throat> and Conviction is trying to write a colonial Australian kind of period drama. Um, there had been a, a little spate of those and I was like, oh, that's a really important story and that's a way to, uh, to write a play about something bigger than me and to try and write about society and write about our country. Um, uh, but through the process of that attempt is kind of uh, beginning to expose um, what has to be kind of the kind of subjective um, and very intimate kind of uh, emotional responses um, that that come from that attempt, I guess. Mm. Yeah. And and I think in those three works, and certainly we talked about this before, that there's a sense of collapse or decay or, um, mm. you know, not in a pejorative sense, but those works like a, attempt to set something up which is either impossible or yeah. can't be built or must fall apart. Yeah. Is that very deliberate in your process of writing? Is that just sort of something that happens for you grappling each individually with each bit of material? Yeah, yeah. It usually starts with, um, uh, like I said, like an image or an idea. Um, and then I, I generally probably have to work backwards in order to work out what the, what the attempt is. Like have, I have to kind of extrapolate the idea um, from from an image or from some some it usually starts with something that I want to see mm. in the theatre like I want to see this happen and so I have to kind of bi build everything to to to, <laughs> to hold that yeah to hold that <laughs> image um, but certainly it's a process in the process of writing I think it becomes um, like the first ever draft of Australian Realness was a lot broader than uh, in terms of that first act was was n was a lot broader than the um, uh, naturalistic dramaturgy that it now has, so it, it's a process through the through the writing process. Stylistically right? broader, or kind of conceptual. Ah, uh, stylistically broader. Yeah, it just wasn't. Uh, it, it wasn't sure. I certainly wasn't sure initially what the form I was critiquing or what the kind of form I wanted to use to explore this idea was, and it and it took a while for it to land in this kind of nineties uh, Australian. Um, dramaturgy of naturalism and and family relationships and the kind of dramaturgy of secrets and yeah. um yeah it took a while to get there and it's just a process of of getting more and more specific i think about what exactly i'm talking about and you did you go back and look at those works from your sort of mtc teen travels again yeah. i did yeah uh once we decided that the play was going to be set in the 90s which was again a process that um that took a while to get to I was definitely going back and looking at a, a whole lot of Australian work, especially around that era, um, and uh, and more modern ones as well. But just kind of everything I could find that was a naturalistic Australian family drama. Um, I definitely got to read, <laughs> yeah, to try and work out how they work. Yeah. Um, and what what does the setting in the nineties get you? What was that conversation about? What did it allow you to do? It actually came from um, the. Pl I originally wrote the play uh, set in the current day. And had this, uh, and had the same, uh, the same conceit of a middle class family being kind of invaded by a family of bogans, um, and it, uh, I think it was the very first development we did, and the first read through with actors that we realised these characters they were playing these really heightened, um, extreme bogan caricatures felt very dated and really don't kind of exist on our stages and screens as much as they did. They felt like they were very much placed. Um, historically in, in a certain time in Australian um, history and, and you know it's around that kind of like um, full frontal and fast yeah. forward like those really extreme caricatures um, which I think eventually led to something like Kath and Kim so and then it became about actually tracing the the 
representation of working class people on our stages and our screens and film. And it was a process of going, oh, we used to maybe see uh, working class people portrayed more like this in this kind of broad comedic uh, style and it was like oh 1997 that's when the castle came out and that's when John Howard got in and that's when Pauline Hanson ran for the first time it was just about tracing the lines of class and going oh there's these weird kind of intersections happening in terms of what's happening broadly socially and what's happening in terms of representation and so uh, the fact that we don't really see uh, working class people portrayed in this certain way nowadays <clears throat> we're more likely to see working class people in Australia portrayed on screen in a kind of like Animal Kingdom or Snowtown way that's that's uh, or like John Jarrett in Wolf Creek like they've kind of gotten scarier. Uh, so to answer your original question the, cho the choice to set the play in the 90s was going I actually want to look at that that's sort of what I want to look at the 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 process and the way things have changed and kind of go back to see how we got to where we are today. Yeah. And have the been elements of class or kind of questions grappling with class in your other works and particularly in, in John Conviction in the sense of, mm. you know, in Conviction I'm thinking of characters that are pretending to be one class mm. and, and aren't or... Yeah, I think so. I think probably more subconsciously than consciously when I was writing them. But certainly it's always a quest. It's always a... There's a... I think in Joe as well as Conviction there's a sense of um, the, the those... Um, central female characters have a sense of inferiority and of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, like imposters. Syndrome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they feel like imposters. They feel like they shouldn't be there. Uh, and I think that that is definitely that just comes from my own experience of coming from a working class background and then ending up in the in the arts in in a city Melbourne and feeling like a bit of an imposter and feeling like I don't really you know having to pedal to catch up and, and always feeling like a bit of a, a bit of a fraud. And so, do, yeah. do you feel there is a, an inherent kind of uh, classism at work in Australian theatre? Or... Yeah, it's, I think definitely, I think it's quite subtle and I think a lot of people don't, it, yeah, the idea of even is there a sort of class problem in Australia is quite a yeah, contentious we, question. Because we like the myth <laughs> that we're a classless yes. We love it. We're Society, we're, we're very yeah. good. <laughs> in terms of white Australia, we're convicts. And yeah. so we're just like, we love, we have a lot of pride in um, in not having class problems that exist in other countries. Um, and, but I think that is a, that that's a myth that it has been, you know, it's constantly being exposed. Like there was a study about, um, that, that asked Australians to kind of identify their class and people are very, reluctant to identify as upper middle class or upper class. And so even though statistically we know we have a lot of very rich people in this country, um, those people aren't identifying as upper class. They're like, oh, no, no, I'm middle class. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like that. Um, but uh, I think, yeah, this was the first play that I really went explicitly. I mean, obviously from the kind of first image I had, I was like, okay, this is a play about class and I'm thinking about class and I'm very aware of how it is functioning on Australian stages, even just the fact that it's absent, that people aren't talking about it. <clears throat> and I think in film and TV as well, that, that myth of we're all the same is, can be quite dangerous. Um, and I think there's quite a few people talking about it more at the moment and going, where are the, um, where are the working class voices yeah. on Australian stages? Where are the working class voices in Australian drama schools? Um, who can afford to go to drama school now? Uh, I'm hoping that it can work on a few levels. I would be ideal. Um, it's definitely, it's definitely about, as you said, it's about this middle class family, and it's it's really um, squeezing them to show what comes out when they're put under pressure. Because uh, I think uh, the thing about class in Australia as well is it's very segregated. We don't really classes don't really talk to each other, um, and. Oh my God, particularly in our media, like... You well, just I was have... just thinking about the election, yeah. reading the play <laughs> and going, how has, you know, how has it changed since, yeah. since the election in terms of a world that seemed very... There was a certain segment of society, probably, you know, um, middle-class theatre makers that were very surprised at the outcome of the election. Yes, definitely. And maybe we shouldn't have been, or maybe there, there should have been less. Yeah. Yeah, it was funny, actually, the election. I think I happened to have a visit to my family just before, to my family um, town where I grew up a few days before the election. And before that I was like, I was, you know, just taking in, the, I was consuming my regular content in my bubble that I now live in and going like, yeah, I think this is really gonna, I think we were in for a real chance to have a, a really 
maybe a more exciting future. Um, and then I went back to Seymour, which is actually a labor seat, but in terms of going, just as soon as you step outside that kind of inner Melbourne green seat, you go, oh, okay, as soon as, um, as soon as we don't have the age in the Saturday paper and we're back to the Herald Sun and we're back to primetime TV, uh, it was, yeah, I, I was very much not surprised <laughs> by the result. Just because, the, yeah, because of that se segregation, because um, the amount of advertising that Pauline Hanson and um, Clive Palmer do, um, I mean, they were even, Clive Palmer was advertising in Brunswick, which just goes to show how much money <laughs> there yeah. was for his campaign. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I digress. Uh, yeah, I think, I think... Has it changed the script? Have you... Do you think um, or it just kind of makes it more prescient? I don't know if it has changed the script. It's definitely, we've had conversations around it. It probably has changed it a little bit. Yeah, it's, the script has changed a, a wee bit in terms of the, um, the kind of trajectory of a few of those characters and about, and that sense of where the play is heading, the kind of forward, um, the, the forward momentum of, of, because we start in 1997, but I think we end somewhere um, that's more forward looking. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really specified, but, but there's a sense that the play is moving forward very, very quickly. Um, yeah, I think the play may have um, felt a bit more optimistic if, <laughs> if, if the result had been different, yeah. but it felt, um, yeah, unfortunately kind of made the play feel more relevant somehow. Yeah. yeah, and I think a lot of that theatre that you have dived back into skims along the surface of a lot mm. of those things. Not, not to say that it, it didn't speak to its own time, but the conversations we're ready to have mm. or perhaps are able to have mm. beyond those those generations are quite are yeah quite, quite absolutely. interesting and time just moves so fast i think just the difference we can see um from 1997 till today is is so massive uh but if you look at any um one piece of research I did was uh, looking at the history of Fitzroy and uh, Collingwood and Carlton and kind of North Fitzroy, that pocket of inner north, and looking at the history of those suburbs. Um, and I read an amazing uh, PhD by Tony Birch, um, which was about the gentrification of that area and just kind of from the 30s onwards and about the, um, the way those, the working class of that, of those suburbs were kind of driven out and the rapid gentrification of the 70s onwards and how it was this kind of, um, really vibrant artistic community that very quickly um, papered over the people that it was getting rid of. Um, and so every, and I think the more attention that comes to the history of uh, certain areas and certain land um, is just exposing more and more the kind of constant process from colonialization to today and how it's just been a, a constant kind of papering over and forgetting about the people who get driven out. Yeah, because remembering's hard and yeah. complicated. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, do you think Australians, I mean, huge generalisations, do you think we go to the theatre to have, to be asked to grapple with sophisticated mm. things? Mm. Yes, I feel guilty. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a really good question. Uh, what do we go to the theatre for? I mean, it, I, I find it hard to answer because I go to the theatre to get ideas to write yeah. plays or I go to the theatre to, like, see my friends make great work, I hope. But I think... Um, that's one of the concerns of the play as well. It's like, who's going to the theatre and why? And what are we going to see? Um, and I feel like these plays that I was seeing um, and that have been a, a huge part of Australian theatre of these kind of m white middle-class families sitting around eating dinner and um, talking about their relationships are um, a reflective of what we're going to the theatre for. We're going to see ourselves and we're going to see ourselves. And so whatever is put on the stage um, will kind of draw the people who, who have those same concerns to come and... Because we want to see, we want to watch something that we can relate to and that holds a mirror up to us. And Do you think we go to have our beliefs confirmed or challenged? I mean, I know that's again yeah. a generalisation, but what's your hope? I mean, my hope is that we go to be challenged yeah. and we go to think about things in a different way. I certainly know that I, that's the most satisfying experience I could have at the theatre is to actually go in like feel something, learn something, see something a different way, come out and go, you essentially want to go to the theatre to lose an argument because then you've learned something. And then you come out and go like, oh, I went in thinking this one thing and now I've got this whole other different set of ideas to grapple with. Um, I think that that's the kind of high, the high hope of, of what <laughs> theatre might be able to do. But there are certain things I think that get in the way of that in terms of who, who gets there, what stories are on the stage, who's on the stage, mm. yeah. Without giving too much away for Australian realness, 
by the end of the you know by the end of the play and hopefully the production obviously we're even sort of pulling apart the theater itself i suppose mm. is the is the non-spoilery way to say it mm. when did that decision arrive was that always part of kind of the trajectory of the work or was those when did those elements mm. arrive the ending of the play only came from not thinking about it logistically or practically and just going like okay what do i what do i and really like listening to a gut kind of intuitive process of going like, okay, what do I, as like sitting in the audience, what do I want to happen now? What would make me go like, <gasps> like what make what makes me excited? Yeah. And a lot of that is to do with imagery and I kind of write in the images more and then after they have to go in and go like, okay, what are people saying? What is the language of this space? Yeah, there's a very specific casting in the play as well. Yeah. Can you talk to that and, and when that arrived? And, oh yeah, yeah. the doubling? Yeah. Yeah, the doubling has always been there, I think. Um, it was a concept that came, yes, right at the very start. It was like, um, okay, this is going to be a play about two families. Um, all right, let's, why not have them played by the same actors? I'm also just very, I've worked in independent theatre for so long that I'm like, well, I can't have eight actors, so yeah, I have to make it work. With, <laughs> yeah, I was like, I have to make it work with four. Um, but also how I was like, at, at, you know, starting as an actor, I was like, ooh, that's fun. That's yeah. like something that an actor is going to And tapped into that absurd tradition. And, yeah. You know, and, fast and, yeah, exactly. Yeah. As well as pointing the play, like positioning the play in a place of, that is already moving away from that idea of naturalism, having... Yeah. Greg Stone play the middle class dad and then come in, you know, in a, I don't know what he's going to be wearing, but in the mullet or something. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that came pretty early and that was the, that was a sort of conceptual frame that could be, and that was to do with kind of um, pitching it for a commission as well. So I could really go, these are the kind of key things you need to know about the work. And so you've known very early in the process that you were writing it for Malthouse. Did you have... Yeah. Did you know which space or you just knew that it was... No, yeah, no, I didn't know what space. I just knew it was a process of uh, writing it for a commission, which is kind of separate to programming. It um, was writing it um, and then, yeah, a constant kind of dialogue around where it was at and, you know, programming deadlines and trying to get, trying to get drafts out that are clear enough for a team to be able to, <laughs> and that was a, I think that was quite down to the line when I went away to Drysdale. It was like, okay, well, we need to know how it ends. <laughs> so I went away and went like, okay, I've got to come up with an Good ending. <laughs> and I was very unsure about it when I wrote the ending, but I think a, a testament to writing from a place of intuition is that I just kind of sent that off and went like, I don't know, I can't explain it, but that's yeah. what I've come up with. And they're like, that's perfect. That's I think what's that boldness is what you know, yeah. they respond to. I, I think you're... Um, relatively famously often in your productions in yeah. literal or uh you know figurative kind of ways but it, uh, are you in Australian realness yes, in, in the such, same way that's such a good question and there was a conversation um with Declan Green who's dramaturging the play earlier because he's directed my mm -hmm. past two plays where he was like is Zoe in this and I was like oh I, uh, ugh, I don't know I think the f the figurative answer is yes because, uh, in, but it's not as literal maybe as um, the plays where Zoe Dawson is like, yeah. their main character. This play is more from, a, is I guess moving away from that direct autobiography, but it's talking about something that is very pertinent in my life, which is that I grew up in a um, very much outside of the arts in a more working class family and who are, clo who, you know, are closer to the Hogan than to the middle class family. But I have sort of moved to this, you know, I'm an, a playwright living in Melbourne and they feel, those worlds feel very far apart, even though geographically it's only an hour off the Hume to visit my family. But that space and that kind of sense of a kind of dual identity um, is something that uh, I think is very, is, is pretty easy to kind of, to, to see in the play. But the character of, the kind of lead character of daughter is, is, yeah, it's probably some sort of amalgamation of my worst <laughs> self, but it's not directly, it's definitely not my kind of life experience. Yeah. Do you think that's the process for writers in general to move from the explicitly autobiographical to mm. perhaps the, you know, the more buried? Yeah, I think it is. I, I see that in, I teach playwriting as well, and I, uh, uh, it's re it feels very, very natural to write what you know, for your, especially for your first play, and everything that comes out of a young writer seems to be you know, generally you haven't like lived that much and you haven't seen that much and you maybe your world just continues to get bigger and expand as you get older. And so this feels like a, it feels very much like a maturation of, mm. um, of my work to, to write about something that 
required a lot of research, <laughs> a lot yeah. more research yeah. than my previous plays. It yeah. felt, um, it felt like a really good challenge. Yeah. yeah. And when we first started talking about um, publishing these works of yours, you, you talked explicitly about the idea of the three of these works, mm. not as a series necessarily, but as progressions or what is it like as a writer who's been able to um, have, you know, a, a relative high frequency of production, mm. essentially, to be able to have those muscles and to flex them? And how do you feel as a writer mm. in Australian realness versus, you know, th that first playwright yeah. and spoken word is Joe? Yeah. It's funny, it feels, it's, it's funny that you say a high level of production because as a writer who's kind of averaging a play every three years, it feels like, oh my God, yeah. I'm never going to. It's all relative in Australia. Yeah, it's so relative, <laughs> exactly. Um, but yes, absolutely, I'm very lucky in terms of having work produced with relative frequency. <laughs> Who knows what the future holds. Um, I'll put an asterisk in the video. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, I think as a, as a person getting older and getting much more comfortable with who I am, I can probably look back on something like The Unspoken Word is Joe or even Conviction a few years ago with, with more fondness and kindness to myself than I could have when I was that age because now I'm, I, I'm still very self-critical but I, um, I have a sort of yeah, fondness for that, the person that I was at that time and the concerns that I was writing about. I don't tend to look at it as a real... Um, I'm, I think I'm aware that I couldn't have got here without going through that process first and I think that... Um, just a personal kind of philosophy that like I, I'm constantly trying to be kinder and more gentle and um, understanding to myself because I think self-flagellation isn't very conducive as a person yeah. or as, an, as a writer. Yeah. Do you think though that I'm interested in kind of anxiety as a as a useful feeling Yeah, well it for definitely creativity. produced drafts, that seems Yeah. <laughs> do you, um, you know, do you miss that? That anxiousness, is it useful in points or is it always a kind of yeah. hindrance to, to writing? I think that that youthful energy and anxiety, it's probably another word for it, <laughs> and that passion and that kind of desperation to be someone and make your mark and have and put something into the world that like exists and is great, it is really useful and I do miss that. I miss... Um, Something about especially writing, you know, The Unspoken Word is Joe, the first sort of solo play that I wrote, just feeling like so amazed at, that it was going to go on and that actors were going to do it and people were going to come and see it, like the whole process. And then once you do that a couple of times, um, I've definitely had a process throughout my 30s and in the last few years where I'm like, wow, I really, something very differently has to drive me now. It's not about, and I think this is probably just a process of growing up. It's not just about like, um, getting attention basically yeah. it's not about um, being loved and feeling important and feeling a part of things it's actually about if I you know it just becomes much more about the practicalities yeah. of um, of life as an artist which becomes more like how do I pay my rent and how do I this and I have to really care about something in order to put the time a lot of unpaid time generally into something yeah that's certainly a conversation I'm having a lot of um, dare I say mid-career or mm. Mm. Post-emerging, whatever yeah, you want to I say. Post-emerging. Post-emerging. Post um, yes. <laughs> uh, it's definitely a conversation about kind of the fuels. The fuels different, or the reason yeah. that you do it shifts, and accounting for the. Um, I suppose I'm also really interested in kind of just you know. Feeling, as you're growing into your power, I suppose. Mm. I mean, it's just kind of a strange way of saying it, but being feeling deft or skilled. At yeah. something as opposed to that early stuff which is driven by guts yeah. perhaps and terror um, yeah, exactly. do you feel that at work in Australian realism in terms of just your process how you've crafted it or do you, is it still mm -hmm. just as sort of chaotic chaotic <laughs> and terror filled I think <laughs> what's that saying about like to rein to make an apple pie you have to reinvent the wheel like it does feel like that it feels like it shouldn't yeah and I've always like oh, I know how to do this now I know how to write a play but every single play is a completely different beast and in, in hindsight, I can look at these three works and go like, oh, I learnt that in that and then I applied that to that and then that taught me this and then that. And I can see all the things they have in common. But when I actually sit down and go, I'm going to write a new play, that all goes out the window. And I'm like, <laughs> I, have, I don't know anything about theatre. I want to like go back to Wikipedia and be like, what is theatre? Yeah. Like, I don't know anything. It's yeah. really strange. And whenever I'm not writing I'm like I love writing I love writing plays it's so much fun and it's so joyful and then when I'm actually sitting in it I have to like 
lock myself to my chair. Like I'll do, I'm like, writing is horrible. I hate this. I don't know why I would do this. My partner can definitely attest to that, <laughs> that process. And so it's sort of, dep- it's sort of devastating. You're like, I thought this got easier. Um, I think you just get used to it. You get used to the, um, the process and you actually kind of learn to trust it and go, no, this, this does feel awful. And it has felt awful the last few times. And so I must be on track. Like yeah. this is normal this is at familiar. least. <laughs> it's familiar. Yeah. And so it's just my last kind of question is, is do you, what class would you consider yourself currently in terms of kind of oh, yeah. belonging more at the Hogan's or? Yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I don't, I feel like, uh, I feel essentially like an imposter in both worlds. Yeah. I think when I, um, when I go back to my family, uh, to, to where I grew up, I feel like, uh, like a city slicker, <laughs> like, you know, um, I'm one of the only people in my extended family, um, to have gone to university and I'm certainly the only person who works kind of full time in, in, an, in the arts, I think I'm just like going through my cousins mentally. Yeah. Um, but so it's not so much about a uh, class in terms of, um, yeah, I feel like the, the artist cultural class is, is unusual because it's not really about money. Like yeah. most people in my family make a lot more money than I do, yeah. but I have access to a kind of, I have a sort of cultural and social privilege that comes from working in the arts and from um, being really overly educated that, he, that means I can apply for grants that might get me you know, to go, go live in Paris for a few months. Like I, there's a social mobility involved in being educated um, and having any kind of cultural capital that is very different. Um, I may not ever be able to buy a house, yeah. but you know, I, in terms of being able to live a, an amazing life um, and do what I love for a job, I've got a lot of freedom. Yeah. So my answer to that is that I, yeah, I feel, I feel like a bit of an imposter in both worlds. Um, I feel like I kind of have my family and I have my chosen family and they don't really connect as much as I would love them to. I would love to, my dream would be to be able to bring my mum to see more theatre that she really loves. Yeah. yeah, that would be great. Yeah. And I think I've kind of written this play with the idea of like, how can I please my family and my chosen family? How can I bring my, I'm like, I feel like my family will really like yeah. this um, and they'll think it's funny yeah. and strange and um and still be talking to the people that I also really care about. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And lastly, what are you most excited about to see the production? What's the oh. thing you're most excited? Oh, I'm so excited by all the actors. I think they're all <laughs> wonderful. And, and we did a development at the end of last yeah. year with uh, Linda and Greg, uh, Linda Cropper and Greg Stone, and they're just so funny. I could just watch them. Um, yeah, read a phone book, I think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I'm very excited about Romani Harper's designing it, who I've worked with previously on a lot of work. And she's done it. I got to see her presentation the other day and she's done an amazing job. I was really, um, yeah, I got really, really excited when I saw her set um, and all the cool things that it can do. Um, and I'm excited about the conversations as well. Like, I feel like, as I said, I think, I think class is a, a kind of delicate area to talk about um, in Australia. And I hope that the play is funny enough um, to deal with it in a, in an entertaining and a compassionate way. And I'm excited about talking to people about it afterwards and being like, I don't know, what do you, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. Great. Awesome. Well, thanks for talking to us today. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank and you. good luck for the show.